During a recent class field trip to the Marin Museum of the American Indian, which sits on Coast Miwok land, I was struck by one piece in particular from their current contemporary Indian art exhibit called Braving Two Worlds. This piece is called A History of Gold by Harry Fonseca. One of a set made of pyrite, plant life, sand, and gold, materials gathered from gold country, it is a direct reference to the physical, emotional, and spiritual genocide of the native people of California. From the rise of the mission system to the discovery of gold to statehood and beyond. It moved me so much because while I've lived in the Bay Area for more than half my life and known of the Coast Miwok, thanks to this museum, I originally came from a small town at the northwest corner of Orange County in Southern California called La Habra, and I realized I had no idea who the original people were in my hometown. So I did a little digging. What I found was a similar story to so many others of a culture that lived a sustainable, spiritual, and independent life but was devastated by introduced disease, murdered for bounty, forced off their land into slavery and Christianity, and almost completely forgotten to history. Fortunately, there are about 2,000 descendants of the original people still in the area, and they are working hard to ensure they are not forgotten. My search found reference to the Tongva people. One video I watched changed my childhood perceptions completely. You see, La Habra has a large population of people of Mexican descent and I was taught that those people were recent immigrants, a combination of Spanish Europeans and the indigenous Indians of the country we now call Mexico. But what I saw in the faces of the video were the people from my childhood, my classmates, friends, and neighbors, and I realized that the people I thought of as from Mexico were probably Tongva people who had intermarried with Europeans, not in Mexico, but in Alta California. I reached out through social media and was introduced to a Tongva woman who shared her story with me. Irene is Tongva on her father's side, but she and her father had no knowledge of this heritage until about 10 years ago. They had only identified with their Mexican side, but along with many others, a burgeoning interest in cultural heritage uncovered their local past. Her father and she had been working for federal recognition and a renaissance of Tongva culture ever since. The story she told me was echoed many times over in my research. This was because from the time of the missions and up until the mid to late 20th century, it was better for one's survival to be considered Mexican rather than Indian. Even after there was no longer a bounty on an Indian head, it was easier to live in the area and find employment as a Mexican. With the help of Irene and many others, the story of the Tongva is finally being told. At the time of European contact, there were over a hundred independent villages in the greater Los Angeles Basin, which goes as far north as the Santa Monica and San Gabriel Mountains, the coastline down to southern Orange County, including Catalina and the southern Channel Islands, and inland to the Riverside San Bernardino area. Most of the villages were near rivers, springs, streams, and the coast. Some people moved between lowland and mountains based on the season and weather. The area had abundant game and seafood. They used wooden canoes for sea travel and reed rafts for river travel. They were known for their beautiful baskets. The people spoke a Shoshone dialect and numbered about 5,000 at the time of contact. The original name of the people is lost, but they became known as the Gabrielenos after the area was under the jurisdiction of the San Gabriel Mission. Today, they are most commonly called the Tongva, although it must be noted that some argue with that name and say it is made up. For over 200 years, the Tongva have struggled to survive under such harsh, harsh conditions that as late as the mid-20th century, it was thought that they were an extinct people. With a greater interest in discovering one's roots and increasing understanding of the importance of archaeological evidence, starting in the 1970s, the Tongva descendants began to re-establish their presence in the area. Now that it is no longer dangerous to be an Indian, many have begun a quest to discover a lost way of life. Today, after decades of social activism, there are signs that the Tongva are beginning to get recognition as the original people of the area. As they gradually began to identify themselves openly, they found that many had secretly kept their identities, language, sacred sites, and customs alive. They have fought and won state recognition, but still struggle for federal recognition. The barriers to federal recognition are like a catch-22. It requires land, language, and people with a certain blood quantum. The irony is that the longer they go without the recognition, the less likely they are to have it. Many educators and activists are working to bring back the language, the dances, and spiritual practices, and preserve sacred sites. 
the Tongva and their supporters continue to fight developers from destroying the few sacred sites and untouched lands in the area. Memorable Tongva people and legends are being shared, both through storytelling and art. Toy Purina is one such woman. She was an extraordinary medicine woman who led a revolt against the missionaries in 1785, after they forbid native practices. Her likeness shows up in museums, schools, and even the missions she fought. Cindy Alvitre, a professor in ethnic studies at California State University at Long Beach, is of Tongvin descent, and in the late 1980s she had a dream of a giant warrior whose shoulders were mountains from the Santa Ana mountain range. Lava spewed from his head and his eyes were closed. Later in the dream, she was in front of a lake with canoes. When they moved in unison, the warrior opened his eyes, the lava stopped, and the mountains parted. In between them was Catalina Island. The dream stayed with her, and two weeks later, she got a call from Jim Noyes of the California Indigenous Maritime Association, who asked her if she wanted to help build a tiat, a Tongvin sea canoe. When he described it, she was floored. It was the canoe from her dream, which she had never actually seen before. That dream became a reality, and the canoe had its inaugural launch this past September 11th in Long Beach. As Long Beach and other cities began to recognize their Tongvin past, the story of the Tongvin people is becoming more well-known. They are scheduled powwows. The town of Santa Fe Springs has a Tongvin exhibit at Heritage Park. Santa Monica opened Tongva Park in 2013, and murals celebrating the Tongva are cropping up in schools and libraries. Towns all over the Los Angeles area are recognizing their Tongan connection. The struggle is far from over. They continue to push for federal recognition, which will help secure access to land and aid for the disadvantaged. There is fighting amongst the various Tongva groups regarding who would own Tongva casinos, which could come with federal recognition. Casinos have helped other tribes bring economic development and alleviate the abject poverty that afflicts such a huge percentage of indigenous people. Regardless of the current struggles, one thing is for certain. The Tongva people continue to live in their ancestral homeland and are definitely not an extinct people.